world peace is an absolute essential. We never seem to come much nearer, but we haven't got into any major trouble in the last 35 years. Here's Steve with tonight's rundown. Easter Monday, 1917, Canadian troops take Vimy Ridge in one of the cruelest battles of the First World War. The men who fought that battle are the subject of Pierre Burton's latest book. Justice Alan Linden, chairman of the Law Reform Commission, talks about changes to our criminal code. Is there life after the Bennetts? You might find out in this book. And from Vancouver Sun columnist Marjorie Nichols and province cartoonist Bob Krieger. But first, Vancouver voters enter the computer age for this weekend's municipal elections. A punch card marks the spot, and Jack finds out how. For my very first time, I happen to have a vote in the Vancouver mayoralty elections on November the 15th, along with 290,000 other people. And guess what they've done this year? They've introduced voting machines. So we're going to see how it works by chatting up and getting a demonstration from Bob Henry, the city clerk of Vancouver. Off we go. And Bob Henry has been city clerk here for 27 years? Not the city clerk. I've been in the office 27 years. Time you were retired. It's getting that way. Now, uh, I'm worried about voting. First time I've got a vote in Vancouver. Is this going to be complicated for an old guy like me who always needs his glasses to see anything? Your average intelligence, or maybe you're under it. I think you can work it. But supposing I've got trouble before, before we talk about the machine. Who's going to help me if I'm kind of nervous and a bit old and a bit frail? There'll be demonstrators at every poll. Everyone has the opportunity to try it out, to be shown how it works at every poll in the city. Now, and if I should follow up my ballot? You can bring it back to the DRO and he'll give you a new ballot. But I must use this, uh, what do you call, voting machine in the privacy of the, of the, the, what do you call it? The booth. The booth by myself? Yes. All right. Here's a demonstration ballot, correct? Correct. Now, I haven't read the instructions. Do you really want me to read the instructions? Well, you should read the instructions because every voter will get a little pamphlet mm -hmm. explaining this. And it's only a punch. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of it. People think it's a computer. It's a punch. And they punch the selection out. Let me demonstrate the wrong things first. How about that? That would be upside down. It's not even inside the gadget. So it's got to be right side up. And slip underneath that plastic shield there. And slip underneath the plastic shield, tapping it in. That's right. Make sure it's flat. That's important. OK. The card's flat. But I don't have to hold it once I've got it inside. That's correct. I now move the punch delicately up to say, we'll say I'm voting for whatever. Right. One. And then in the next one, I might be voting for how many? Oh, maybe. We'll oh. say two. OK. Oh, you've got to have it right in position against the name or it won't click. Yeah, there's two arrows actually to line up. There's an arrow on the punching device here and there'll be an arrow on the card and you just line it up opposite the name you choose. But how many sides, how many ballots do I get altogether? You'll get three cards and they're two-sided. There are issues on both sides. And the first card is for what on each side? There's the mayor and school trustees on one side, the first card, and right. in the back of that card is the alderman. So therefore, having done the mayor and the trustees, I then whip this out delicately, put it back in again, right side up, right. demonstration ballot, and tap it in once more to there. Correct. And on this side, I will now be voting for my 10. Alderman. Ten. Must I vote for 10? No, it can be 10 or less. 10 or less. Right. But not more than 10. Not more, or the ballot will be spoiled. And I'll make my ten punches that way. Oh, that's quite good, because it won't punch unless the arrows match up. That's correct. OK, now, having done the first one, how many more ballots do I have to do? There's other two cards. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one, the second one, has park on one side, park commissioners. Mm -hmm. And uh, the park's capital plan is on the other side. Mm -hmm. Then the third card is all the capital, the rest of the capital program. That is works and fire halls, libraries on the other side. So I've got to punch six sides of three cards. That's right. And the voter will be reminded in the, in the polls mm -hmm. that there are two sides to each card. So this is a big step forward you've taken, Bobby. I think it's a big step, but I think it's the right way. We can't go on the way we've been doing because now, it's so horse and buggy jack the way we've been doing it. Once I've done my ballots, what about the secrecy of the ballots? If I hand it in like that, you'll see what I've done. Good question. When you get your three cards, you'll get a secrecy envelope. And this is it here. 
When you finish voting, you slip the three cards into the secrecy envelope, and no one can see how you've voted. Mm -hmm. You take it back to the ballot box, mm -hmm. and there'll be somebody at the ballot box there. They will take kind of this file. tab off, give it back to them as a receipt, in essence, and that goes into the ballot box. Now, how are they counted? They are counted at City Hall, not counted at the polls. That's the problem we've been having. Three o'clock in the morning, people hand counting little ticks. They'll be taken to City Hall, and they'll be run through high-speed readers, do a thousand a minute, there's four of them, and that's connected to a computer, and you'll get instant results. How long? <laughs> oh, <laughs> somewhere between uh, 11, 11, 11 and midnight. We'll get the results at once. You'll get the results starting about half past eight, I would imagine. You will, eh? Yeah, the first, first poll's in, the, the readers will, and the computer will produce that poll's results right away. If I'm blind, I can't see, you'd supply somebody on oath to do the punch for me. There is someone there that would help if you're blind, yes. Or you can't even operate that. We, there's provision that we would assist. Looks all right. I think so. Hope it works. I hope so, too. When I was a small boy at school in Scotland in the 1920s, the early 1920s, and it came to Armistice Day, it was always an incredible emotional experience because there would be 10 or 15 fathers of children in that class who hadn't come back from the war. The other night I'm playing trivia, and the question was, name three of the great battles of the First World War, and nobody knew. Who wants to talk about the First World War anyway now because we know that war of the new style is impossible. But guess who comes up with a book about the First World War? And I don't know why he's written it, really. It's the incredible Burton. And he writes a book about Vimy. Now, where did Vimy stand in the great battles of that disastrous 1914-1918 war? It was part of the Battle of Arras, and it was the only victory the British had had in 32 months of war. It was fought almost entirely by Canadians, four divisions with one British brigade, they did what the French couldn't do, they did what the British couldn't do, and they did it very, very quickly with a few casualties. They started off at dawn on Easter Monday, 1917, April the 9th, and by noon, three of those divisions were on the crest of the ridge eating their lunch. How many men had they lost? They hmm. lost 3,000 deaths and 7,000 wounded. That wasn't the end of the battle, though, was it? That was a new position. How many yards of dirty, rotten mud filled with bodies did the Canadian Corps when? Oh, they're about, two, about two miles. It wasn't the distance, it was the heights. Vimy Ridge was the highest point on the entire Allied line, 400 miles. You could see more of the war from the top of Vimy Ridge than, for, than anything else, which gave the Germans an unfettered field of fire against, against uh, the guys on the other side. Uh, it was a, the toughest bastion. It was a minor Gibraltar crawling with gun emplacements, riddled with dugouts and tunnels and subways, and with big guns behind, hidden behind the escarpment. And uh, in the Battle of Arras, Vimy was on the left, it was the anchor point, it had to be taken, otherwise the Germans would have commanded the rest of the front. The irony, of course, was it was the only successful part of that battle because the idiot French general had not listened to his intelligence people. He did not know the Germans, except for Vimy Ridge, had pulled back 30 miles, that devastated the ground and the scorched earth policy, and the troops ran over it and had, and had no objectives to take. And by the time they got to the German lines, they were exhausted, and the battle was a failure. But the Battle of Vimy Ridge was not a failure. We took the ridge when nobody else could take it at a very low cost. The French had lost 150,000 men. We lost 10,000 casualties, and we held it for the rest of the war. Now, when holding that, that's where the incredible giant memorial is to Canadians. It's on Hill, number, Hill 145, day. that's right. Hill 145. Having won that ridge, did it become an important tactical part of the next advance? I don't think so, really. But then I don't think that any of these advances, and I don't think that any of these battles mattered a good goddamn in World War I. What mattered was that eventually the Allies had more men to slaughter on their side than the Germans had. Because just two days before the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the Americans came into the war, providing not only material, but more important, bodies. And I use the word bodies advisedly, because a lot of them were really bodies before it was over. World War I was a senseless slaughter. Uh, Vimy is important to Canadians because it was the beginning 
of our status as an independent nation and not a colonial nation because of Vimy and, and because of the Vimy myth. And we're talking about myths aren't necessarily untrue, but we're talking about Vimy as a myth which followed us for two or three decades in Canada. Uh, Canada got rid of its inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the British and uh, the eyes of the world were focused upon it. The Canadian troops became the assault troops in the last hundred days when we pushed through against the Germans. And uh, that led to the Statute of Westminster, in which we ceased to be part of the British oh, Empire and became part of the British Commonwealth. Pierre, I respect and admire you to the nth degree. Your history books are fantastic, all one of them. But you're not going to tell me that since the slaughter of 10,000 Canadians led to the Statute of New Westminster and Canada emerging as a nation no, in its I own right. No, I didn't quite say that. Now, you must listen carefully, Jack. I'm listening as best I can. I said that the myth of Vimy, which stood for the, for the effect of the Canadians in World War I, led to the Statute of New Westminster. How? Because the Canadians were seen for the first time as a nation able to stand on its own feet and slug toe to toe with everybody else. We were as good as, turned out we were as good as the British and the French troops and maybe a little better. Mm -hmm. And that uh, changed our attitude towards ourselves and it changed the attitude of Great Britain and indeed other countries to us. Don't forget that after the war, Canada had a vote at the League of, uh, League of Nations, even though it was part of the British Empire, as did this Australia and New Zealand. That was a hard-fought battle, and we got it. And therefore, our status in the international world changed because of World War I, of which Vimy was the crowning achievement. Have you got it now? I've got it now, but this yes. senseless slaughter there for, oh, of course perhaps helped to create the nation of Canada. Yeah, well, uh, sometimes wars do help create nations. Create the I'm independent nation of Canada. Create the independent nation. I'm not for a senseless slaughter. I think World War I was a silly, stupid, dumb war. Uh, created by politicians who were too stupid to realize that because of the Industrial Revolution, war was no longer an arm of diplomacy. The machine gun came in, and the machine gun changed warfare for the worse or which, for the better. Which brings me to your incredible research. Now, this all comes from, not all comes from, much of it comes from previously unpublished writings of oh. men who survived. And, and interviews with them, yeah. Tell me about them. Well, my research assistant and I uh, unearthed about 150 veterans of Vimy, and we interviewed about 80. And in addition to the interviews... They're old men now. They're in their 90s. And uh, in, in about half the cases, their minds are as clear and as sharp about Vimy and about World War I as they were when they were young men. The other thing we got was about 25 unpublished manuscripts or letters or documents or diaries, which were very, very useful. Some of these guys sat down and wrote an account for their children, which they squirreled away in attics. And I must tell you, Jack, that some of these accounts are eloquent. They're beautiful writing, even though these guys weren't writers. That experience had seared itself into their mind so much that they were able to talk about it in the most eloquent fashion. And as you know from reading the book, there are a whole series of quotes at oh, the beginning yeah. of these chapters. Most somewhere. impressive, to say the least. But that trench warfare, and it was trench warfare, 1914, the, German, 1914, the Germans put through Belgium, almost got to Paris. And then there were these dreadful senseless slaughters at the Somme, Passchendaele. V Ypres first with the gas Ypres. attack, then, the, then Somme, then Arras, and at the same time Verdun on the French side, and then Passchendaele, which was probably the worst of all. There's a book coming out on that too this year. Were the tanks used at Vimy Ridge by the Canadians? There were eight tanks used, and they were absolutely useless. They didn't know how to use tanks. Nobody knew how to use tanks. They all bogged down the mud and it didn't get anywhere. Tell me about the machine guns, because, you know, when you were boys and you were reading all these glamorized war stories in the 20s. It was always setting up the Vickers water-cooled machine gun and mowing down the Germans exactly by the score. Well, it's the Germans who are mowing down the British and the French. There were two machine guns, the Vickers water-cooled machine gun and the small, smaller Lewis gun. They each fired about 500 bullets every minute, and that is what changed modern warfare. Uh, the young men that went over to fight at Vimy thought that they were getting an it was going to be an adventure. They were going to be... They're dressed in colorful uniforms, and the war will be over by December. They forgot that the Industrial Revolution had caught up with warfare, and the machine gun had changed everything. It meant that you had to burrow like a mole in the ground to get away from that Why hail of bullets. did they dig these trenches? Were they dug by the, hand? They yeah. had no back holes in those days. They dug them all with a pick and a shovel, eight feet deep, and an absolute cobweb of trenches for five miles behind the Vimy lines. Not only trenches, communications trenches four miles long, lateral trenches, row after row, protected by barbed wire, but underneath the ground, there were saps and tunnels and subways. The, there were 13 subways at Vimy. Each of these subways had a, a railway train running through them, electric light, air conditioning, and it was through these subways cut by hand in the soft chalk of of Arras, of, 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 uh, that the, mm -hmm. the troops were able to move up to the front without being shot at and killed. 
It's not folly. Artillery, of course. The Germans always had bigger and better artillery than the Brits and the French. Am I correct? In both wars, well, nobody had a better gun than the French 75. The French 75 was the great gun of World War I. But the Germans had better equipment and better guns, generally speaking, in both wars than our side. But we had more men to kill. Uh, so we, uh, the, the attrition rate, percentage attrition rate among the Germans was a little higher than our side, which is why we won the war. But we won the artillery battle of Vimy because this was siege warfare. Where's the siege warfare? Don't forget that when the Vimy battle began at dawn and a city... Hold your breath. We'll take the battle at the start of the details of the battle at the start of the next chapter in Burton's history. Many books have you written on history now? Oh, I don't know. I've written I've got my name on 32 books, and some of them are anthologies, and some of them are photographic books, but I suppose I've written, I don't know, 15 or 20 history books. Well, with Pierre Berton, after the break. You know, in the Second World War, and uh, the, no, the first and second, they talked about casualties. That includes killed, wounded, wounded missing, missing, and sick. Yeah. Guys who had to be removed. Yeah. Had the French, we're talking about Pierre Burton's book, Vimy, a bargain at $24.95. Your books don't finish up in coals, do they? No. $24.95. The French had already tried to take, how big was Vimy Ridge? How many miles? How many acres? How many whatevers? Well, it was about seven miles long, and the Canadian section, which is the section that counted, the high section, was four miles. Our front was four miles. And we had one Canadian Corps. And one, four divisions, 100,000 men, because our divisions were much larger than the French or British divisions, and we kept them reinforced. When we lost men, we broke up the 5th Division to do that. Not only that, but uh, the, the, uh, the, the Canadian divisions, uh, the Canadian Corps is really an army, although they called it a corps. But Vimy was General also... General Curry. General Curry was the first divisional commander. General Bing uh, was a Britisher. He was in charge. Not only was it four miles long, but I should tell you also it was 400... 50 feet, about 450 feet high, about 500 feet high. The whole thing. And it sloped up this way. When we, we had to go up the slope this way, and it cut off like an escarpment on the other side where the Germans were, the woods were all on the But back. once you got to the top, you'd won the ridge. No, you had to take the other side, too. You had to go down the other side. Yeah, but by the time they got to the top, the Germans were running away. How many days, what would the average age be of these 10,000 Canadian casualties in that 18, battle? 18 or 19. We forget the World War I is fought by schoolboys, high school boys. The youngest was 15 at Vimy. He enlisted at 13. There's many 16-year-olds at Vimy and many more at 19, 20, 21, 22. The whole thing was damnable looking back on it. Yes, it was. It was damnable. How, how long did the, the British or Canadian artillery barrage last before they moved out the trenches? About one minute. It was the famous creeping barrage. Oh, yeah. What happened was we had 1,000 guns and 150 machine guns all firing at once. There was a moment of silence, about five seconds, and one gun barked, and the whole thing opened up. And within about a, a minute to three minutes, the troops went over the top. The barrage moved at the rate of 100 yards every three minutes. And the troops are trained, and this is why we won, one of the reasons we won, to stay very close to hug that barrage, as they said. It blew forward. The, the shells blew forward of the men, so they didn't shoot back. Well, many of our men were killed by our own shells. Oh, sure. But they had been trained specifically to do that. They, that had never been happened before. The Somme it didn't happen there. So far behind, the Germans popped up after the barrage went over out of their dugouts and this mowed to, them down. This was to get them before the Germans could come up and set up the machine Exa guns. Exactly. And they were successful. As, totally successful. Except for 10,000 casualties. Well, but that's minor compared to the Somme, where in the first day of the Somme they lost 50,000. No, 10,000 by World War I standards was peanuts. It was, some of the veterans said it was a piece of cake. We just walked up the ridge. There was no opposition. They'd blasted the wire to pieces. They'd turned the German trenches into, into mush. They'd uh, ruined the dugouts. The Germans came up shaking like a leaf. I said in the book, as you know, that the, except for the explosion of Krakatoa in 1883, this was the loudest noise ever heard in the history of warfare. Mm -hmm. This And uh, imagine yourself going forward above your head, and not very far above your head, is, are, is a screaming canopy of, mm -hmm. of, of steel, a lot of it red hot, pouring from the guns and landing just in front of you. And you have to move at exactly the same speed as that. Was this the first time the Canadian Corps had been in a major action? No, it was the first time they'd been in a major action as a, as a total corps together. The they had been divisions. split up among the Brits. No, they were never split up among the Brits. They weren't a lot, the, the Canadian um, Govern government, but really this crazy, insane uh, cabinet minister, Sam Hughes, had the guts to tell Kitchener, you're not going to split our people up. They're Canadians. They're going to fight as Canadians. They're going to think as Canadians, which they did. Uh, they'd been at Ypres. They'd fought uh, several battles. They'd been on the Somme. 
with several divisions, but this is the first time, indeed the only time, that the entire Canadian Corps walked ahead out of the trenches at the same time mm. from Halifax, Prince Edward Island to Victoria, B.C. The Canadian and Scottish over here run it, and the Seaforths from here run it. 20,000 men with their packs on their backs and a tot of rum stiffening their resolve and another 10,000 behind them to, to leapfrog through, as, a, as the tactics are called, and behind them, 70,000 support troops, artillery, service corps, ordnance corps, runners, medical corps, stretcher bearers, every kind of cooks, everybody. Fearsome. Yeah. Well, at least we'll never have that kind of battle again, will we? I mean, Vietnam was... Uh... Money for old rope compared to that kind yeah, of this slaughter was, on the field, wasn't it? This was not? warfare at its most uncomfortable. You mentioned Sam Hughes. Now, you said that crazy Canadian cabinet minister, Sam Hughes. Didn't Tell people him. about Sam Hughes. Sam Hughes he was... He was defense minister. He was the minister of militia. And he was, in my opinion, in the opinion of the prime minister, who later said this, and, and several others... Which prime minister? Bo it was Borden, Robert Borden. He was certifiably insane. He was a kook. He was a nut. <laughs> he thought people should form squares and things like that. He thought he should have been given two VCs for his part in the Boer War, and he used to plague the governor general to everybody's embarrassment demanding these two Victoria Crosses. But the one thing he did is he, he went over to see <coughs> that awesome figure, Kitchener, mm -hmm. and say, we will not be broken up. Our men will fight together as one unit. And because they did, of course, they got a sense of community you were asking at the beginning, what's the, yeah. what was the purpose? Well, this was the purpose, to give people the feeling they were Canadians. Frank Worthington, whose son Peter you know, yes, yes. and who became a general in the Second World War, fighting Frank, was only three days in Canada before he joined up. He's British. He said, I thought of myself as British till the day of the Amy Ridge. When I stood on the top of the ridge, I knew I was a Canadian. Oh, that's very well said. I see Victor Odlum, one of our famous family. Was, was he one of the generals in that? He was a brigadier general. He started the, he invented the trench raid, or is credited with inventing the trench raid. I think more than one did that. He had a very bad time at Vimy because the 4th Division was up against Hill 145 where the Germans had hidden machine guns that nobody knew about. And that was the, he was in the longest of the fight. And that fight went on for two or three days. The rest of the battle was over by, by dusk on the same There's day. There's one very intriguing little bit in your book which <coughs> might bring back uh, relationships to another war, a later war. Were there any Japanese Canadians from British Columbia fighting in the First World War at Vimy Ridge? There were indeed, and they fought harder, and, and perhaps because they had something to prove. The Japanese Canadians were known as the toughest fighters on the Western Front, and they were honored by the people that fought. There were a lot of them in the 50th Battalion from Calgary. Victor Wheeler, who wrote a book about the 50th Battalion, saw several of them. He tells of one man who had his father's samurai sword and went over the top and was finally killed. And these are the same guys or whose children, you know, we treated so badly in this town in World War I, II. Well, you were here then. I was here then, and I must say that I, to my, you, uh, on my paper, we opposed the movement of the Japanese. It was the Little News Herald. The bigoted paper was the Vancouver Sun. I never let them forget that. And remind them again. Yeah, they did. They were bigoted in their, in their editorials. They, they thought the Japanese were... What about this? That's great. I hope everybody buys Pierre Burton's Vimy book and a lot of the old survivors in this town. Yes, we had a party the other night for eight of them came to the party, two of whom are in this book, and the stories about them in the, this book. They had a wonderful time. What about this man, Burton? How old are you what now? What man is that? Old That's B. you. <laughs> How old are you now, Pierre? I'm 66. You're not really, are you? Yeah, I'm 66. I have to get the old age pension, for what it's worth, uh -huh. and give it back to the government every April. Uh, do you dye your hair? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? I don't, even, I don't even bleach it. It's, that is a natural it's white color. It's natural. It has been for some time. Are you a fisherman, an angler on the west coast of some note? Yes. Mm -hmm. you, as you well know, you saw me haul the first fish in this year on Hell Straits boat off Seashelt. Is it the not CBC <laughs> cameras grinding. Is it not a fact that you are responsible for Mr. Strait getting flustered and almost wrecking his boat on the rocks? I don't think I was responsible. That certainly happened. You were there, too, so you've got to take half the blame, Jack. <laughs> Best of luck, Pierre. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Say the best of luck to you. It's like <laughs> wishing the Pope well, holiness. You never know. You never know. <laughs> My thanks to Pierre Burton. He's always a great standby interview. Never ever to let you down, does dear old Pierre Burton. I'll be back after the break. They're changing the criminal code. Now, that doesn't affect thee and it doesn't affect me because we would never do anything that brought us within the orbit of the criminal code. At least I can speak for myself. And with me today is Mr. Justice Alan Linden. 
uh, president of the Law Reform Commission of Canada, who with a vast staff and lots of money has been working on bringing Canada's criminal code into the 20th century. Am I correct, Mr. Justice Winters? You're correct. We're trying to bring the code in the 20th century, but our staff isn't as vast as it used to be. You know, there's government restraint now, and we're a lot tighter and leaner these days than we used to be, and so it should be. It certainly should be. <laughs> I will not pursue the cost of your commission. But what I do want to ask you is, with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and I ain't no particular friend of that, has it influenced your uh, revision of the Criminal Code of Canada? Of course, the, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms has to influence everybody in this country, you and me and every government, and of course it affects the criminal law. And so many of our reforms are really to try and make the criminal law correspond with the requirements of the Charter. Can you be specific where well, you've had to change the criminal code because of the Charter? Uh, in particular, in the area of free speech, there have been a number of criminal code provisions that intrude on free speech. For example, defamatory libel. You can go to jail now for defaming or insulting somebody. We've recommended its abolition because we think that's in violation of the Charter. You're talking about criminal libel. Criminal libel, right. Uh, Civil if libel, I would say some terrible touched. things to you about a public official, up to your amendments are made, he couldn't only sue me civilly, but first he could have me sent to jail for criminal libel. That's true. You and wipe that out. Well, we're recommending that be wiped out. It hasn't yet been wiped out. Similarly, blasphemy, which used to be considered such a terrible thing 100 years ago when the code was written, Nowadays, I don't think people are too seriously worried about people saying bad things about religion or the good Lord. And so there, too, we don't think we need the criminal law to put people like that in jail. But what about uh, freedom of speech for Nazis, freedom of speech for extremists of the worst order, freedom of speech for those who want to advocate a return to Hitlerian tactics? Are they protected? Will they be protected well, by your new criminal code? Well, there, to some extent, of course, there are they are protected, but our new criminal code maintains the hate propaganda crime, that you cannot foment hatred in Canada, although you can discuss uh, things that people might find unpleasant. And, but it's a difficult line to draw between but freedom of speech than that. I and hatred. I can go to a public meeting or wherever, and I can advocate the most horrendous policies or horrendous what, uh, no, political not. beliefs. Yeah, the beliefs, as long as you're not promoting hatred against people by reason of their race or religion like or sex this, or creed. These uh, extraordinary Aryan churches in the United States, would they have freedom now to operate in Canada where they preach hatred of the black by the white? Well, not if it's hatred of a black person because he's black. And uh, that, we think, still has to be prevented in a country such as ours, which has so many minority groups. And they, they do need a certain amount of protection. Mm -hmm. Mind you, one of the things you did was wipe out the stupid old-fashioned segments, such as? Oh, there's a lot of crazy old things. Uh, dueling, witchcraft are both still a crime. Stink bombs are a crime. Uh, it's a nasty thing to do to somebody, but I'm not sure if people deserve to go to jail for that. There's a card game, you, you may know about it, called Three Card Monty. Oh, yeah. Do you know about that game? Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. It's a crime in Canada. I don't, I don't know if it's played anymore. I don't know anyone who's ever played or even known what it was. You're obviously more ubiquitous than even you think you are. I know, but I remember when I first got on board a Canadian Pacific train coming across the country, these horrendous notices that if you engaged in gambling for cards, you could get life imprisonment or something. That's right. Now, um, let's get back to the more serious stuff. What have you done about pornography? We haven't really gone into pornography because, as you know, there's been a royal commission on that, and the government has legislation prepared, and so we didn't want to duplicate it. So therefore, you've let go of pornography, you've let go of abortion, I presume? Well, we haven't done anything yet, but we're, we're beginning to think about it. Nobody's anxious to get into this, but the Supreme Court, as you know, has the case of Morgenthaler again. They may well strike out some provisions of the current law, and we're going to have to be ready in that event to have some alternative uh, there for the government to uh, adopt. There's some material that I got before you came here which kind of confuses me. I always understood that if you were really drunk, hammered out of your mind and killed somebody, that you couldn't be convicted of murder because you could not form an intent to murder. Am I correct? That's right, but the law would convict you of a lesser offense of manslaughter now. 
And similarly with some other offenses like um, robbery, you, if you're really drunk when you do it, you wouldn't be guilty of robbery, but is you might be guilty of assault. Is this a change? Well, we're recommending a change. We don't like the way the current law is structured. We don't think that anybody who commits any crime while drunk ought to be able to walk out of the courtroom door. It might well be that they lack the specific intent required for the offense, but they're still doing something that's socially unacceptable and they should still be punished. You mean at the it. moment, if I am really totally, absolutely drunk, I can't be convicted of a crime? Of certain offenses, for example, theft. If you, while drunk, stole something, you couldn't be convicted of anything, you would just be set free. We would say, if you steal something while drunk, you're guilty of stealing while drunk, and you should be penalized for that, not perhaps for stealing itself, because the mental element is missing. You're liable to be misunderstood in this, because that would seem that sentences for violent crimes while drunk might be less the sentences severe than might, if you were right. properly convicted. The sentences might be less, but at least you would still be convicted. You're still responsible if you voluntarily get drunk. Obviously, if uh, you're impaired involuntarily and you didn't know it, if you've been to the dentist or something like that, it wouldn't be dealt with that way. Now, there was a little bit of a side here, but I noticed there was a decision in Ontario, that strange place for legal precedence, <laughs> whereby it said that... Um, you could not be automatically sent to jail in a mandatory fashion on a second offense if the crowd so sought because that would be discrimination. Surely we all want people who are up for second impaired driving offenses to go to jail the second time. Well, we have in this country, fortunately, I believe, toughened up significantly on our treatment of drunken drivers. Just recently, the, the Law Reform Commission advocated and the government <coughs> adopted the blood testing for people who uh, were involved in drunk driving and things like that. And we really have to start cracking down on that. But the case in Ontario, uh, which was written by one of Canada's leading jurists, really, Mr. Justice Charlie Dubbin, uh, was really dealing with the question of uniformity of law. And the problem was that a federal law had been enacted, but which was proclaimed only in certain provinces and not in other provinces, which meant that people in certain provinces would be treated differently under the criminal law. And oh. the court said that that was improper. It would be like having capital punishment in British Columbia and not having capital punishment in Ontario. The person who commits a crime in either province should be treated in the same way. So the therefore, if we come that. to the date where all the provinces, attorneys general, bring in the provisions whereby on a second impaired defense by indictment you go to jail in a mandatory fashion, that'll be okay. Probably would be okay. It yeah. merely wipes out the discrimination. It was the differences in the different provinces. You, of all people, must have noted how the United States is moving to the right in some of its judicial decisions and moving away from this great, uh, making it easy for the criminals, right? The Miranda case. Are you doing that anyway in this amended criminal code? Well, I like to say that we're doing two things. We're both toughening up on certain areas where we have to toughen up, like drunkenness, like mm. pollution, like terrorism. New areas where we haven't been tough enough in the past. But then there are other areas where I think that we've been too tough. Some of these silly old things that nobody cares Habitual about. Habitual criminal hearings. Well, even habitual criminal hearings, if people were locked up for their life because they were, they were thieves. Uh, it's really of no danger to anybody. It's a nuisance. But should a person really be in prison all their life? And historically, we, we've recently changed our mind on that. And we've said, no, they shouldn't be in prison that, that long. But we had a case the other day where a dangerous offender, a noted pedophile, uh, gets uh, a long sentence. And yet, He's eligible for parole and he's got the temporary absences in three years. What about sentencing? Have you well, finished your report on sentencing Well, we yet? did work on sentencing some years ago, but as you know, there's now a Canadian Sentencing Commission that's been sitting for two or three years, and their report is just about ready to come out. You should get their chairman on here in about two or three weeks, um, Judge Omar Archambault. Mm -hmm. And they're reviewing the entire sentencing uh, system and I think some of these questions ought to be dealt with in their report. When will your draft criminal code, if it's accepted by Parliament, result in the old books being reprinted? Oh, it'll still be two or three or four years, I think. I mean, ours is just the first draft. There'll have to be many discussions, consultations, debates. Oh, you know, know the Canadian way. I can way. imagine it. The provinces have to say their way, the lawyers, the judges. But uh, we hope in two or three or four years we ought to be getting ready for a new code. When do you get back to work in the Ontario Supreme Court? when I've finished this job here, which has another year or two to go. 
My thanks to Alan Linden, the uh, president of the Law Reform Commission of Canada. Lots of work ahead for lawyers. That's right. After the break. <laughs> British Columbia has, has entered a brand new area of politics. We are now in the exciting era of the ZAM, Bill van der Zam, not forgetting Lillian. And the ZAM, of course, replaces two men, these two men. They are the never-to-be-forgotten W.A.C. Bennett, crowning his son, Bill Bennett, Jr., Bennett II. Now, I have here tonight to give us some of the intrinsic background and drama of the Bennett regime, Bill Bennett, two experts in the field. One is Marjorie Nichols of the Vancouver Sun, and the other is Bob Krieger, who wakens up in the morning to try and find something cutting to do about somebody with these pen and ink drawings. They have written a book which is called Bill Bennett, The End. My first question is to Mr. Krieger, who is quite a wickedly satirical cartoonist. Did you ever meet the man whom you lampooned so fiercely and viciously? I met him for the first and only time at the uh, Socrate Convention uh, up at Whistler. And did he speak to you? He said one thing to me. He, uh, he, upon introducing myself, he, he looked at me and said, uh, you don't do my nose right, and he walked away. And did you not do his nose right? I always thought I did a pretty good job, but it was too late by then. Now we turn to Marjorie Nichols, who has written this very succinct, succinct um, history of the Bennett regime. It's, isn't it funny how quickly we've forgotten Bill Bennett already? I know, 11 years. That's, uh, I mean, that's one and a half presidential terms. It's a, it's a lifetime in politics. And yet, as you say, Jack, since that Whistler convention where we elected the ZAM, uh, Bill Bennett's like, uh, I guess, behind the Iron Curtain. He's among the missing. Yeah, but this is a vital historical document. Now, do you spell out in this precisely why he quit, why he walked away? Many of us were kind of fooled by the disappearance of Bennett, were we not? Well, Jack, I don't think that he walked away at all. I think that he was standing on a downhill incline that was so steep that it was simply a question that he, he, was, he was sliding and skidding down, and he leaped off before he hit the bottom. This was a man, and it was very clear to him and to the party, that he would take, he would have taken the party down with him. He had to walk when he walked. You're telling me it was an unselfish political yes. move of his own. He realized he, he could yes. no longer win, but you're not going to tell me he expected Van der Zand to take over. Jack, I, they never expected, Bill Bennett didn't, nor did any of his handlers ever expect that Bill Van der Zand would be a candidate, much less that he would win the convention. Now, you know, to you, Van der Zam already is manna from heaven, is he not? He'll be the greatest thing to cartoonists <laughs> and slice bread. Let's Jack, just, he can just lie abed in the mornings yeah. now, and his <laughs> cartoons will draw themselves. Let's just look at the way you have treated some of the most gracious politicians in this country. Let's see Gracie. Where is she? Madam Premier is so formal, a simple your grace will do. <laughs> And you waking up in the morning and thought, I'll make her the queen. Is that right? She, yeah, she, uh, she was my second choice. Uh, Van der Zandt, of course, because he sued uh, a fellow cartoonist, was was every every cartoonist's number one choice for for Piermer. But but Grace was, uh, you know, the hair, the look, the little fang she was, and the attitude was. Uh, she would have been fantastic as, as the next best thing. While you're talking about lawsuits and whatnot, overturned <laughs> eventually by the Court of Appeal in British Columbia, what was the subject next one of the lawsuit? Uh, Bob Bierman, the cartoonist for the, at the time for the Victoria Times columnist, drew a picture of Van der Zand pulling the wings off of flies. And you have just reminded the flies that the man who, <laughs> who sued over pulling the wings off flies is now the premier. We fly. Tell me, Marjorie Nichols, uh, there are, there's a young generation here, not that you're old, but there is a young generation who might not understand one particular phrase you use in your book about the dress of certain social creditors. What is a full Nanaimo? Oh, uh, that is white shoes, preferably plastic, along with a white belt, preferably plastic, and a, and a white tie, preferably made of polyester. And that's how you can tell when spring has arrived in <laughs> British Columbia. Uh, I remember one occasion, Jack, we all went off to a federal provincial conference in uh, a town in Quebec, and when the BC delegation arrived, they looked like the entertainment. <laughs> they, you know, they had everything except a 
you know, some little drums and some I'm, pipes behind them. I remember one column of yours, I think it was during a political campaign when you were in Victoria, whereby you continually referred to Mr. Bennett's wardrobe in a very acerbic manner. What was that? Mr. Bennett had no regard for a wardrobe. Well, I remember that uh, I first met him, the, well, when he first ran in the by-election created by his father's retirement. And then I was in Ottawa, Washington, the rest. I came back, and I was sitting in his office. His, one of his press secretaries was present, and I said to her later, I said, what was that that Bill Bennett had on the knees of his pants? It looked like he'd been down, you know, praying or something like that. I thought he'd been kneeling in the rose gardens outside. It was, and she said to me, there's nothing on his knees. She said, that's his knees that are showing through the knees. <laughs> this was a man who had his shoes resold and who, uh, well, he didn't buy it. He, do you remember the most famous suit purchase of all? Shortly before Her Majesty arrived, that is, they were tying up the Royal Yacht Britannia at the dock in Victoria, and he rushed down. Luckily for him, they'd had a fire overnight the, in a, one of the better clothing stores in Victoria, and he rushed down to the smoke sale. He was standing in the rain at 7 o'clock in the morning waiting for the as store God to open. As God is your witness? As God is my witness, and he said to them, Look, he said, I need a fast job, shorten the legs on those. <laughs> I'm going to need them this afternoon. And uh, he has worn those two suits that he purchased on that occasion. Uh, this is a man... Uh, We've been too light-hearted. Oh, yes, we are. We are. Did they we gotta catch get... the guy who set that fire? <laughs> <laughs> but let's get back to issues and back to Krieger. Take a look at this one and note the date, which will come up shortly as April the 1st. Today it says, I have decided to negotiate higher land claims, bargain fairly with government employees, and raise welfare rates to a realistic <laughs> level, April 1st, 1986. That is cruel, Bob Krieger. It's actually kinder than the original cartoon that I had uh, chosen for that, which was uh, simply him and the calendar with the date and no words. Now, uh, you, you cover in your book uh, what was the shame of the Liberal Party, was it not, and also the Conservative Party. I can't even remember who crossed the floor now. Can you? Well, you mean back, wh who created back Bill Bennett? No, yeah, who created Bill Bennett? Sure, there were the Liberals. There was Pat McGeer, Gardy Gardam, and... Uh, Alan Williams. Alan Williams. And did Curtis cross and at the same Hugh time? Curtis, the, it's very interesting, Jack. This coalition of free enterprisers that created Bill Bennett, do you know who the first floor crosser was? Mm. The first name who jumped from one of the mainline parties to social credit was William Van Der Zandt. He was the first jumper. He jumped in. Did he cross the floor in the house? He crossed the floor outside of the house. Ah. But at that time, this was only two years after Mr. Van Der Zam had run for the leadership of the Liberal Party. This was Dave Barrett and the NDP were in power. And uh, I mean, the, the cabals and possible cabals and union movements and the rest, you know, we remember, those of us who were past 21, that uh, it was on the front pages every day. Bill Van Der Zam jumped. And uh, following that, a fellow by the name of Peter Heinemann. And yeah, they were the first two jumpers. Van der Zandt jumped out again to the Liberal leadership later on. That's and right. And I think that some of us who pride ourselves on our analytical abilities should have watched Mr. Van der Zandt. Mm -hmm. That at the time that he and Mr. Williams and some of those original mm -hmm. ship jumpers arrived in the Van der Zandt ship. Just we like, yes, we like Sri Lankans in a lifeboat. That's right. But you see, we ignored the fact we ignored it when they jumped ship and swam to shore. Yeah. <laughs> we, we should have known that the ship was going down long before that. Then we come to the campaign. And let's see this cartoon. This is a good one, I think. We of the Top 20 Club know full well that you can't buy a premier. You have to rent one. Uh, that figure is not a recognizable person, merely a bloated capitalist. Is that correct? <laughs> and the names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> the Top 20 Club was quite a story, wasn't it, during the recent yes. campaign? But let's get back to Bennett's performance. Uh, what was the single most effective thing he did as Premier? I was the single most effective thing he did as Premier, I suppose. Because he wasn't all bad. Oh, he certainly wasn't all bad. In no. fact, his first term in government, what he did was he recreated a climate of relative calm in British Columbia following those years of turmoil under the NDP. You know, rightly or wrongly, between 1972 and 1975, this was a place that was just, it was rocked by dissension and, uh, and uh, the doubts that were created. And when he arrived from 1975 until 1979, British Columbia was a very calm, mm. a regular, Time affluent good. place. And I think that his major contribution, Jack, was that 
he took British Columbia into the mainstream of Canadian politics for the first time. When Bill, under Bill Bennett, for the first time, a, a British Columbia premier arrived in Ottawa and they didn't all fall down in the street laughing. Mm. They counted on the BC premier to add some levity, levity and some humor, but no substance to any national but he negotiation. Did. He did. He definitely did. And there was no more. Uh, and in fact, we forget, but uh, Pierre Trudeau and the Liberals rolled out the carpet of welcome for Bill Bennett when he became the Premier. Those were, they were very civilized days. Mm -hmm. Later on, he faced some very tough opposition, but I want Bob Krieger, the cartoonist, uh, with Marjorie in the book, Bill Bennett, the end, to explain the next one. Explain the next one, Bob Krieger. I don't do windows or cabinets. <laughs> oh, I think I get it myself now. Yeah, this was done just after, uh, I guess, the, uh, Stephen, re uh, Stephen Rogers finally resigned. He was the last of Oh, and that cabinet kerfuffle yeah. about conflict of interest here, there, and everywhere. There was Curtis and Waterland and, uh, am I naming any wrong names here? No, no, there no. Was there was a Nielsen, a bunch Curtis, of scandals. No, there was uh, the, some minor allegations of conflict yeah. of interest here, there, and everywhere. Waterland was the guy who held the Western pub chair, yeah. wasn't it? Now, as to you, what, would you say that the, the most hypocritical thing he did was the restraint program and not telling us about it in the previous campaign? Well, sure, but I suppose an argument can be made that under our system of government, you can do anything you want. I mean, the mandate that you devise for yourself uh, retroactively is anything that you want it to be. I don't know whether it was the most hypocritical, but I can tell you one thing. It was, it cre it was the demise of Bill Bennett. Uh, the restraint program, uh, Mr. Bennett could not have put an end to himself more quickly than as if he had taken and thrown himself onto a, a pointed picket fence. But he did beat the threat of the general strike. He, he did have the Kelowna Accord and did all he, the rest did, of it. 50,000 well, people in the streets and he beat them. Jack, I don't, uh, there are various interpretations. As someone said, the history remains, to, you know, has to pass judgment on that. I don't think so. I think that what happened was that Jack Monroe of the IWA and a couple of others saved Bill Bennett and the province of British Columbia from a terrible fate in that fall of 1983 when the people were marching in the street. Uh, who's going to be your favorite target? Just the one target in the new government? Just Bill Van Der Zam? It's, it's a pretty big crew. It's tough to say, but Van Der Zam you can't beat. If he turns out to be uh, moderate and, and not too controversial, then uh, hell, we can always open casinos. And will you predict, <laughs> say that again, we can always open gambling dens. Sure. <coughs> and will you predict that there will be no reappearance of the big blue machine in any way, shape, or form? Or do you think Bill might be suborned a smidgen? No. I don't think we're going to see the reappearance of the blue, big blue machine at all. I think we're going to see the reappearance of the, of the ghost of W.A.C. Bennett is what I think. Mm -hmm. But Van der Zandt's a better cartoon anyway. It's great. The book is Bill Bennett, The End. The author is Marjorie Nichols of Vancouver Sun. The cartoonist is Krieger of the province. And, and I, Webster, wrote the foreword, and I'll be back after the break. <laughs> it's the last call for love. My thanks to Messrs. Nichols, Krieger, Burton, Mr. Justice Alan Linden, and the voting machine, which couldn't itself speak. Tomorrow, Kitty Kelly, the American who wrote the unauthorized biography of uh, Frank Sinatra, called His Way, about which he is very angry indeed. Tomorrow we'll find out why at 5 p.m. precisely. <laughs>